very happy to be here. Uh, uh, Doctor, I talked to, to Dr. Nuno and Salop and Fernandez, who have all spoken here before, and they, and they all told me that you're a tough crowd. So, uh, <laughs> so I, I hope, I, I hope I'm, I'm up for it here. Uh, I want to talk, what I want to talk about today is, is extremism in politics. And my take on extremism might be a little different from what you expect. I think expect. you need to use the mic for the yeah. Do you? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Your voice drops. Oh, guys, we're hard to hear it. All right. <laughs> Is that better? Yeah. I want to talk a little bit about extremism in American politics today. And uh, I'm not entirely against it. So let, let's, so let's, let's start by uh, to, to talk about, uh, about our next president of the United States, Sarah Palin. <laughs> I was the wrong crowd. Sorry, I was preparing for that. Was, that, was, that was yesterday's talk. Sorry. All right. Uh, I want to know is Sarah Palin an extremist? Yeah. Yes. Definitely. Yes. No, actually, not. Actually, yes. Is the Tea Party extremist? They don't Why? What makes Sarah Palin? Or the Tea Party extremist. I want to hear it. So let me see some hands. If you're gonna, if you're gonna tarnish them with this name, I want to know why they are extremists. Yes, ma'am. Yes. The main thing that bothers me, I mean, other than the guns solve everything, is uh, the idea about abortion. That it it doesn't matter what happened. You're raped, incested, and no choice have that baby, because I said so. So because they they disagree with you on abortion, they're extremists? No, no, that isn't it. It's, <laughs> <laughs> it isn't just that they disagree with me. I mean, I agree with you on the position, but I, I, I uh, Yes, sir? <clears throat> if one could draw a bell curve of political thought, which may be impossible, but if you could, then obviously, perhaps, you could define those on the uh, last 10% uh, or so of on either side as uh, extremists, or out, certainly out of the general uh, mainstream of, of uh, political thought. Uh, where would that place the Democrats the Red Rocks in Yopi County then? Uh, am I dealing with a bunch of zealots in the room here? <laughs> Just one. <laughs> Kiss me in the back. <laughs> I think in, 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 my, in my view, Sarah Palin is not an extremist. In my view, she's, she's more in the middle of the Republican. She took her out to lunch, but, she's, <laughs> but she was she was the cage running mate, and, it, and, and the Tea Party has kind of pulled her in, and she's seen a political advantage to that, I think. And I think that it has to do with how, how, how much how much government folks want in their in their lives, or think they want in their lives, I think. Would you regard the Tea Party as extremist? I, I, I would say a lot of them are, they're, they're a mixed bag. They're a, they're a mixed bunch of folk, but I think a lot of them are. Right. Uh, what, and what would make the extremists in the Tea Party extreme? Just stay out of, you know, Tear down as much as much public funding and as much accepted. Don't mess with what you're already funding for me, of course. But you know, tear down as much public funding for anyone other than me as, as you can. And and it's hard work and it pulls up my own bootstraps. And if you don't succeed, it's because you didn't deserve to and all of that jazz. Okay. All right, fair enough. So then again, it comes down to their to their politics that makes them extremists. Let's take another one more. Yes, sir. I heard two Republicans coming into this meeting today, Tom O'Halloran and Lucy Mason on the radio, and they talked about ideology. I think extremists, the Tea Party is extreme because they're willing, for the sake of ideology, to bring down the system. They're talking about the current Arizona legislature is willing to prevent the system from working for their ideology. That's what makes the Tea Party, at least some of its members, extreme. Palin is out to lunch. <laughs> uh, what I'm hearing, and this is, this is what I'm hearing, is uh, essentially is the argument that 
someone or someone someone or a group is extreme or an extremist based on their politics, on their ideology or their political views. As a political scientist, I don't like those kind of definitions. Right? Have you ever heard because have you heard the phrase one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter? Mm -hmm. In other words, what I might regard as extremist, you might not. And so therefore the word extremist becomes it becomes simply a political cuss word in which we use it to insult others who, who we disagree with. I, I don't think that's a very, I, th I think there's more to extremism than being a cuss word. Because what I think extremism is, is rather than an ideology, I think it's a way of doing politics. Let me give you an example and, uh, of, of, of extremism, uh, and this time it comes from the left. This is, uh, I'll tell you a story of a man named Stephen Foster, who was a member of the Garrisonian wing of the radical abolitionists. And in 1841, Stephen Foster walks into a church in, um, in uh, uh, Lynn, Massachusetts, uh, to the Congregationalist Church. Mm -hmm. And he walks in, sits down. The Reverend Mr. Cook is, is preaching at this time. And in the middle of uh, Reverend Mr. Cook's sermon, Mr. Foster stands up and be in the middle of the pews and begins denouncing slavery and denouncing the church, that particular church, for being complicit in slavery, for not allowing abolitionists to hold meetings there, for not speaking out. Uh, Mr. Cook's demand, the Reverend demands that he sit down. He refuses. He demands it three times. Still, Stephen Foster is preaching against slavery. At that point, a handful of very large men grab Mr. Foster uh, by the scruff, tear his clothes, and uh, forcibly kick him down the steps and out of the church. Foster gets up dusts himself off, walks across the, the square to the Baptist church, goes into the Baptist church, and again stands up in the middle of the sermon and begins preaching against slavery and denouncing the Baptist church for not being uh, sufficiently abolitionist. And this crowd also grabs Mr. Mr. Uh, Mr. Cook, roughs him up, tears his clothes, uh, gets a few kicks and punches in, stuffs him in a, in a broom closet until they can figure out what to do with him, and then decide to just rough him up a little bit more and then kick him out. So he's kicked out of that, the Baptist now. So he once again stands up, dusts himself off, walks across the street to another church. And this time he goes to the Quakers. Figures the Quakers, well, they're, they're pacifists, they're no problem. So he goes to the Quaker church and again stands up in the middle of the sermon and begins to denounce slavery. This time it's the ostensibly nonviolent friends who take him, uh, grab him by the scruff of his neck, tear his clothes, and rough him up and, and again physically throw him out of the church. He once again dusts himself up and then finally uh, and, and walks across the square until he holds his own abolitionist meeting uh, uh, later that evening. Now, Stephen Foster, by the end of the summer of 1841, has been kicked out of 24 churches twice from the second story. He's been arrested four times, and he nearly created a lynch mob when he accused the U.S. government of being a wicked and nefarious conspiracy against the, free, against the, uh, against the freedom of four million of our countrymen, referring to the slaves. Now, how many of you here would regard Mr. Foster as an extremist? <laughs> Absolutely. How many of you here would hope that had you lived in 1841, you would have the courage to do the same thing he did. Absolutely. 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 Now, this Foster raises the problem for those of us who, who uh, for those of us who want to dismiss the Tea Party and Sarah Palin as extremists, or the Democrats and the Red Rocks, I suppose. And that is that what ha what do you do with an extremist whose politics you agree with? <laughs> And this suggests, again, that, pop, that extremism is not an ideology in itself. And if we continue to believe that one man's extremist is another man's freedom fighter, then, again, we're only going to use the word as, as, a, as a cuss word. When I think we can actually have a little bit more clarity on what this, for what this term means, and perhaps how it can be of value sometimes when doing politics. So let's compare who we've talked about, the abolitionists and the Tea Party, uh, and the Democrats of the Red Rocks, I'm going to throw you all in there. Let's compare it to Osama bin Laden, who I think we would all agree in this room qualifies as, as a zealot. What, why would we consider bin Laden an extremist, and where we might not be so comfortable throwing the Tea Party door or, or Mr. Foster in the same pile? 
Certainty of conviction. Certainty of conviction. How many of you are pretty certain of your convictions? Yeah, well, we can't really use that one then. Although, although oh, we might want to say it's necessary but not sufficient How about that. Yes, sir. Um, like the Taliban and uh, etc., they use uh, force in terms of killing people, innocent people. Uh, it's not military against military or one country declaring war on another. Mm -hmm. It is just pure hatred and instilling hatred to the point of violence. And I would classify that as extreme. So hatred and violence. If any, has anyone read any Osama bin Laden? No. I recommend it, actually. I recommend it. There's a book that collects most of this, some of his earlier statements. And he argues that it's actually the United States who hates Islam. And he's merely acting to defend himself against Islam. And, and he cites the invasion of, of Iraq and the, the, the situation in Palestine mm -hmm. and the uh, invasion of Afghanistan as the reasons for it for that just proves that the United States hates Muslims. And I assume that probably many in this room uh, would actually agree with his policy or you know his opposition to some his, uh, American intervention in those areas. So <clears throat> the hatred becomes a strange term, but the question of violence, that seems to me to be an interesting one. Although we have to deal with the fact that Stephen Foster himself, what we all agreed is an extremist, is a pacifist. In fact, he kind of helps develop some of the initial nonviolent tactics. Whenever he's arrested, he goes limp. When he was sent, when he was put in court, he, he turned the courtroom into a trial against slavery. He didn't care about what, you know, def he defended himself and he always turned the, the, every trial into a, a condemnation of slavery. And so many of the nonviolent tactics developed were actually in, in, in that, that we saw in the Civil Rights Movement, for example, or that Gandhi used, were actually developed in the United States uh, by the abolitionist movement. So violence certainly can be a feature of extremism, but it doesn't seem to be always a feature of extremism. Yes, sir? The end justifies the means. The end justifies the means. Well, that's interesting. I think now we're, now we're getting somewhere, because now you're starting to talk about not what you believe, but how you're willing to carry out those beliefs. And I think that's, that's getting us in the direction I'd like us to go. Yes, ma'am? Going in that same direction, I about, about, about uh, how, how one does it rather than the ideology. Um, but, but talking about violence, I think you have to talk about whether you're talking about physical violence or emotional mental violence. Because in, in fact, what I would argue that Stephen Foster was, was committing violence against those churchgoers by interrupting their, interrupting their worship, which I, I consider not a thing, good thing to do. But we had some experience with that in Michigan with some folks who were doing the same kind of thing around a different issue. And yet, if, and yet if you are complicit with sin, should not someone, uh, 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 should not a fellow brother or sister come along and, and interfere with that sin well, and, and stop that sin? And is not slavery a sin? I mean, this is the logic that the abolitionists yeah, use. I mean, in the Taliban, for instance, and so forth, I mean, their violence may not be against a physical person. It may be physical, it may be refusing education to girls or requiring women to do certain things. And that's an emotional and mental violence by our perspective. So you know, I'm not sure the violence thing is pure. Uh, yeah. I, but again, we're, we're talking about the, the means that we engage in politics, not necessarily the ideology itself. Oh, and, and, enforcement and, of something on other people. Well, isn't that the essence of politics? Haven't you all just been enforced uh, the most conservative le state legislature uh, in, the, in, in Arizona's history, and, and which is saying something, right? Uh, coming from Arizona, and no, right? I mean, that has been, so the majority rule is coercive in, in, in its very nature, in, in a sense, right? So, so, in extent, if we want to talk about coercion, there's certainly a range of, of kinds of coercion, of which emotional coercion can certainly be be one form, but politics is almost, you know, maybe it's, I'm cynical because I'm a political scientist, but, but to me, politics is coercion, in a sense, and, 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 and we have simply, in the United States, find ways to make that coercion, you know, uh, constrained and limited and, and generally, you know, uh, uh, non-painful. Yes, sir? And policies that lead to the domination of one person or group. Policies that lead to the domination of one person or one group. Well, I, again, I would refer to this election as a... a, a <laughs> Isn't, could we argue that that fits pretty well? well let, me, let me put in the complete domination of one person. <laughs> complete domination. Well, 
I mean, that's certain, I, I would say that that would work with uh, uh, 